What's the story, everyone? Welcome back to GEA Fan TV. My name is Aaron. Um, I'm delighted to be joined here today by Patrick Sharkey from uh, GEA Zone Media. We're going to be going over all the weekend's action in both football and hurling, recapping all the games, talking about the big talking points and everything else. And I'll also discuss my uh, football team of the week and hurling team of the week, um, which I've sent on to, to Patrick as well. I suppose we'll start off, though. I suppose only one place to start, really, with football. Kerry, 421, Galway. 11 points. I mean, that was uh, that was some win for Kerry in the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that third goal from David Clifford, you know, if I was Stephen Kenny, I would try and get his phone number. Like, you know, it was absolutely <laughs> phenomenal um, performance from Kerry. You know, um, there's been a lot of comments made about Kerry um, about they haven't actually been training for about three or four weeks. It looks like they've maybe been training for a wee bit longer. But, you know, um, They've um since that defeat to Cork, they brought on a new strength and conditioning coach. Um, he's actually a Bunkrana man, Ryan McLaughlin, now, now studying down in Kerry. Like, and so I, I'd, I'd like to think he played a part in that. Like, so um, but yeah, fantastic, fantastic performance from Kerry. Look, they they probably won't aim to absolutely dust off that embarrassment in November, or and so they have done it, and I'm sure. Or, you know, a, a lot of, you know, the critics are now kind of a little bit more quiet. Um, and as for Galway, you know, I, I thought they had a point to prove, you know, losing their last three competitive games of 2021, like after the lockdown struggle and all the rest. Like, and, but maybe it's, I think it was a wee bit questionable um, against uh, Tom O'Cullohan, um, not giving him enough minutes, like, because his scoring rates in under 20s are quite high, like, and, the league is the best time to give these kind of players a chance. And, you know, but um, it's good to see Comer back, you know, in a full 70 minutes for him is going to do a world of good, like, and the whole team, you know, I think that's it. Like, but, um, and one of the, one of the things I like about the league is that it's usually competitive. Like, it's not like lopsided, like the championship, like, but that, that game proved otherwise. But look, you know, all, all the same, you know, good one for Kerry and go away be looking to make a point against Roscommon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was definitely a weird one from Galway. And I know like a lot of, I've seen in a lot of like Facebook posts and social media posts, a lot of people making excuses for Galway, you know, the first game back, first this. But I don't know, like if I was a Galway fan, I'd be I'd be really worried at the moment because like the first game after the last lockdown against Mayo, they were absolutely hammered, beaten mm -hmm. here as well. Even against Mayo in that Connacht final, like Mayo were really poor that day and they still managed to get over the line. Like when you take Shane Walsh and, and Damien Comer out of the equation and you look at the rest of Galway's forwards, like they they really are relying, I think, on some of those under 20 lads to, to step up, I think. Mm. Yeah, abs ab absolutely. You know, it doesn't always, um, as we've seen, you know, that maybe it can be, maybe it might be like Cavan last year, maybe a lot of this underage success might take about 10 years to actually see it materialise at senior level and even um, there, but Look, I think um, Goa should be um, at their lowest point now. Like and Ross Common and Goa, like to them, it's going to be the game that's is going to keep them keep them up big team. You know, that's going to probably be with this short one, the championship. You know, they're right on the back foot. You know, and everything. Like and um, yeah, I just think it's uh, yeah, it's quite um, a dark day for Goa. But look, they're I'm sure they'll come back stronger. Yeah, and I suppose for Kerry, I mean, with David Clifford obviously getting that hat trick, Paddy Clifford scoring one two as well. Killian Spillane, probably in my opinion, anyway, one of the most underrated forwards in the country. I don't think he gets the same credit as the rest of the Kerry forwards. But is David Clifford is like there's a lot of discussion obviously around is he the best footballer in the country? Is he the best forward in the country? Where would you put him amongst the top footballers in the country at the moment? Yeah, see, it's very, these arguments I always find are very hard to judge. Like, you know, um, I put up a post, like, and the three names mentioned in the comments section were David Clifford, Brian Fenton, and Michael Murphy were the three ones mentioned there. And I, I, I can understand a very strong arguments for all three of them, you know, but I, I can't help but think if any three of them were born in Leitrim, will they be getting the same credit? You know, if Ryan, someone like Ryan Rourke was born in one of those counties, would he be getting a lot of credit? probably like so that's that's what i think it's a hard one to judge like you know and i know it is it is a team sport like but um you know um i feel like yeah you know um as 
as a forward, you know, it's it's a really, really, it's a really tough argument when it comes to these kind of uh, best football arguments. You know, when you have so much good players around you, it's not like you know, it's you know, none of the free players I mentioned are certainly running one man shows where they are counties. They might be the most pivotal players for their counties, but certainly not um, running one man man shows. But um, Hmm. I would I would have to maybe maybe put him second to Brian Fenton at the moment and put Michael Murphy third. So if it's th- those kind of big three, I would say are the ones at the minute. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd agree with that as well. I think we, I suppose with Clifford, like I think he definitely has the potential to be number one. There's no doubt about that. But I think mm. he needs to win a few All Irelands first. Like we're talking about a player in Brian Fenton who's never lost a championship game. Uh, and they play in different positions, so it's a, it's a tough argument. Like Fenton's a midfielder, Clifford's a forward. It's a it's a tricky argument. But I suppose moving on to to Dublin's game, obviously staying in the in Division One South, um, Dublin one twenty two, Roscommon sixteen points at Doctor Hyde Park. Um, I suppose one of the big talking points here, Coma Costello coming in for for Dean Rock, ended up scoring one thirteen despite missing two penalties. What was your uh, what was your opinions on that game? Yeah, absolutely. Big statement by Dublin. You know, they, they made a few late changes, albeit, you know, after they were expected to put out a strong team. But still, it shows how strong the team were, like, and obviously. But um, maybe, you know, you can you can say Ross Common were victims of the new rules. And I won't even blame the referee. He was just playing by the rule book. And that's that, like, but I just feel like, yeah, it um, was a tough game for all of them, you know, but. Uh, yeah, it, it just makes Dublin look good, but stronger. And like you've emphasized, you know, and I, I don't want to touch on this issue. I'm not going to add anything more to it. You know, I think it's, it, it should remain in the past. Like, but after, you know, a few things off the field, Dublin obviously want to, you know, put themselves a good stead. And, you know, they've really, really impressed themselves um, yesterday against um, Ross Common. But uh, like, like that there, you know, um, I'm sure a lot of the Ross Common lads were watching the Galway game and might be, you know, looking at it with a bit of confidence going into it, you know, when they kept... The first half was complete, a bit competitive, but Dublin will always be Dublin. They'll always push on in the second half and lay down their marker. And, uh, yeah, look, and the Dublin v Kerry game next week, uh, you know, should get the popcorn out for it. Yeah, that's going to be a very exciting game indeed. And I suppose with Dublin, like, obviously, like you said there, bringing in a couple of new players, Michael Shields, I was actually quite impressed with in goal coming in there like our, Dublin's third choice goalkeeper by all by all yeah. admission like with Evan Comfort not being available so definitely an interesting one um, but I, you mentioned obviously the real changes there like I mean it's hard to know what they're really doing with, with Gaelic football and hurling at the moment like we had that situation yeah. in the second half where there was a, mm. a foul way outside the box and it was given mm. as a, a penalty I mean I, I'm not too sure who taught that one through in all honesty because like that yeah. definitely wasn't a, you know, it definitely wasn't a goal scoring opportunity. Yeah, yeah, look, it de- de- definitely wasn't, you know, and it was, um, that's there, like, but um, I'm sure, look, the ref- referees are probably trying to read up on it, but I'm sure they're just as much in the dark as, dark as us, like, you know, it's just, yeah. um, it's a summer kind of situation, like, I don't think it's, um, I see they're probably, you know, it's, it's kind of confusing all of us, um, you know, <laughs> kind of, kind of similar to a few of the VAR rules and the English Premier League, like even the referees and the fans, it just it just confuses everybody and the players as well, obviously. Yeah, it's probably a great thing they don't. I think John Coyley was alluding to a, with Limerick in his post-match interview yesterday. Like it's probably a great thing they don't have fans there because I don't know. I think it's the, I think it's the communication as well. Like I I seen mm. on on Twitter like the, the amount of people that didn't know that rule was in Gaelic football. And I'll be honest, I didn't know it was there either. I thought it was just in mm. Hurling. So like yeah, it, seem, it seems here. it seems to be like the the rule just wasn't communicated at all with players with fans with media, um it was just kind of like all right we're gonna give a penalty and then that's that there was no real like I don't know it just it just all seemed a bit of a joke to be honest. Yeah yeah um ab- absolutely you know um it it just feels that way you know but I believe at Congress it's always the league that experiments the rules like and. But I mean, like John Cutlow saying at um, the end of Sunday game the week before, you know, with that, you know, and I, I think Don Don Logue's reaction to rolling the eyes uh, sums it all up, saying, you know, if it's at Congress, it's here to stay or something. But usually, it's it's the league where it's experimented. But hopefully, somehow it's turfed out by Championship, like you know, because 
Um, a lot of games, you know, once you get into this court semi-finals are going to be proper intensive and you don't want it, you know, ruining his chances of winning in All-Ireland. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, could you imagine a situation, you know, in an All-Ireland final where they give a penalty, like a similar penalty like that? Like, there would be absolute uproar. Yeah. Um, without oh, doubt. Yeah. Like, and, and ho- hopefully it doesn't come to that. Hopefully they do manage to find a way to earn it out. But we'll see what happens. I suppose we'll we'll move on to Division 1 South. I suppose your county, Donegal, with a, a two-point win over Tyrone, 18-16 to 16 at Healy Park. You seem to have Tyrone's number at the moment, no matter what they do, no matter what they, they change with managerial pairings or bringing new players in. You just seem to, to have their number at the moment. Yeah, look, I should predict Donny go to get relegated more often, I think. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, look, it was an absolutely fantastic performance for once. You know, um, you know uh, Michael Murphy says in these kind of scrap games, you, you always need 18 points to the perfect score for one. And we got 18 points, which was a good score. Like, you know... Um, without Paul Donaghy you know to, it would have been a lot more of a convincing one from Donegal like I kept them taking over but like you know Donegal were you know it's the first time in my life team I actually remember winning a game at Healy Park against anybody you know never mind here there's been a few neutral games which we've lost like but still you know it's um a good game one for us all the same like and we even had Oren McNeilish on the bench like and that's the kind of quality we don't have like but you know don't be under any illusions, you know. Um, hopefully, we're lucky enough to play an Ulster semi final against Tyrone. Like, and obviously, they still have to get past Haven. We've down in Derry, like, who I, I would consider banana skin teams. But, you know, um, I just feel, you know, we don't want to give too much away. Like, and once they get Cahill McShane back into the setup and everything, you know, I think it'll be all guns blazing. But um, I do think with Tyrone, you know, m- maybe. I think it's too early to ask in the question marks, you know, did they think the grass wasn't always greener at the other side, getting rid of Mickey Harder, what the story was. Like, I don't think we'll know that until maybe the Ulster Championship. But look, I think, you know, um, a good start for us, like, and hopefully we can get some results against Monaghan and Armagh. Yeah, I suppose there, there definitely is still some question marks over Tyrone. And I think we... I suppose we're, we're like a lot of people are kind of looking at teams to potentially come closer to, to beating the dubs or who's going to be the nearest rivals. Mm. And I think a lot of people had Tyrone mm. listed as one of the teams. I don't think we f- we found that the answers to those questions yet. I still think we'll we'll need to see them a bit more. But I suppose from a Donegal point of view, like having Paddy McBrearty back in the, the team as well, like he was injured for, for last season, obviously in the, the later rounds of the championship and, and whatnot, like after the club championship. So to have him back fully fit, like if you have him, Michael Murphy, Ushin Gallon, like it's definitely a serious forward line going into the Ulster championship. Absolutely. I, I, I couldn't hear that more. Like, you know, it's definitely, we're, we're definitely sharpening up the team. Like, and you know, there's some absolutely quality players here. Like, you know, um, like Oshin Gallon doesn't even get to start, start a lot of the games. Like and um, they've moved Patter Mogan into a more forward position, which he played for the under twenties, and he always plays as a number nine for his club. Like he's um a bit of an all rounder, but still, you know, we're definitely um going up in quality, you know, and um yeah, I just I just feel you know um if we get everything right, you know, and we get the right team selections, you know, why not um. Go and maybe challenge challenge the dubs this year. Like, but look, I'm not going to say too much. You know, I'm not. We won't get a full picture of everything until the league finishes up. Like, and you know, we haven't won the All Ireland. Nobody's won the All Ireland. There's still loads of games to go. Like, so you know, um, we we can slip up against anyone. You know, um, obviously, you know, our miles a bone to pick, and obviously Monaghan. You know, they they would definitely view that game body with as a must one after winning, um. Well, failing to one actually against Armagh, you know, there's definitely that bone to pick, yeah. Yeah, and I suppose I suppose moving on to, to that exact game where Armagh and Monaghan, like 116 to 112 in Armagh's favour, I suppose a, a big win for Armagh, like first game back in Division 1 in quite a long time and beating a side that, you know, usually are very good in Division 1. Like they, they've found a way to stay in this division. They've found a way to be competitive and I suppose Armagh with a, with a big win. Yeah, Kieran Donaghy has got um, it off to a perfect, perfect start, you know. And I do think, you know, having Kieran Gini, like they've definitely added an over dimension to their game, like, and, you know, winning in Division One, like, you know, um, originally I would have thought they would have struggled through if it was an eight team league format, you know, but Ulster football form and everything goes out the window. There's, um, you know, that whole game, 
there's saying, you know, there's no such thing as an easy game in Ulster football. Isn't just saying there's actually a lot of substance and proof toward it, you know. And um, so obviously it it is a local derby, Monaghan and Armagh, and it's intense enough for them. But look, they got over the the line, you know. And Stephen Campbell, brilliant. Right, Ryan O'Neill, brilliant, you know, in the whole setup, you know. And uh, Forker, who played at the backs, was quite good. Like so, I think you know. They also always have a point to prove. Like, there's no shame in losing to Donegal, but you know, losing in the format form they did, I don't. I think they'll be a wee bit embarrassed. Yeah, Aiden Falker in a fullback was fantastic. Like hitting the, the three points, and Oshin O'Neill was quite bright. I found in mm. midfield, Rory Grugan as well. They seem to be a lot more well-rounded rather than maybe relying on the likes of your Rian O'Neills and Jamie Clarks and whatnot. So, huge win for our match. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with them now in Division One, especially in the in the next couple of games like would you see Armad? do you think there's even potential for them now to potentially even avoid relegation even maybe even sneak up to a league final because i suppose with the with the way this league is structured like it's um you know they, they'd probably only need one more win and then they're they're in a league semi-final yeah look i, I don't know it'd be hard to see them you know i, I think after judging after the weekend's performances i i can definitely see um it's hard to see past carrying galway way um getting into the top two in that league like so they're gonna have to play a carry or a goal you know and i think next week's game is definitely going to determine who finishes top of division one south so i just feel you know in the northern group you know they need to get that there but you know it's a really really baptism of fire for our man you know and kieran mcgini um you know obviously he's been about hit and miss in championship but definitely when it comes to the league, you know, I think there's no denying he's a top manager. Inherited that that team at uh, Division Three, has got them up to Division One, and if he can turn them into an established Division One team, you know, it's a gold medal for him. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's going, it's going to be interesting. All right, definitely to to keep an eye on our man, especially with the with the way the Ulster Championship is is is, is formatted as well. It could be, it could be very likely that our man play Monaghan in a potential. Ulster semi-final so it could be could be a big year ahead for for our match it's going to be interesting to keep an eye on them I suppose we'll we'll, we'll go through division two Um, I suppose starting off with that win for our good friends Mayo beating down 221 to, to 111 I watched the I think about the first 50 minutes or, the, or so it is just up until the Kerry game came on and I gotta be honest I thought Mayo would start a little bit slow in the league especially with some of the new players coming into that fullback line the likes of Enda Hessian and and whatnot, Rob Henley coming back in goal, Ushin Mullen going into uh, fullback, but a very, very impressive stuff. And Tommy Conroy, like he's definitely a, a top class forward altogether for this Mayo team. Yeah, look, um, as Mark Poland uh, said in your own podcast, you know, that uh, the way it was for Down, you know, Mayo wasn't the winnable game. Mayo was the kind of game you forget about. And to them, it was probably the over two games. Like, now, I don't know if Paddy Talley was telling that to us. Team, you know, I, I definitely d- doubt that. You know, I definitely think they put all guns blazing against me. Like, but you know, absolutely, you know, and people are, you know, Donny on Dublin fans. Like, some of us are going to laugh at me in Division Two. Like, but I, I genuinely think, like, it's it's actually for the better of Mayo football playing in Division Two. Like, because I remember two years ago, um, a lot of our younger players got a lot of game time in Division Two, and that really helped Donny all going forward. I feel so. For me, it's just uh, the best thing for young players is like you're playing top quality teams, but you're not playing the best in the country. So you're still going to learn a lesson and you're still going to get results. So, you know, I just feel for me, that's good, you know, and um, Tommy Conroy is definitely living up to his title. Tommy Goals Conroy, I think is his nickname, you know, Tommy Goal, you know, so yeah. it's definitely well there. And, you know, um, with a lot of retirements and all the rest, like, and um, Henley looks like a good replacement for Clark and I just feel you know yeah look they that's a perfect start for Mayo and um, I'm sure you know with um, Mayo and with me and West Meath probably putting in a low enough scoring game you know I feel they'd be confident of taking all six points in the Northern Group. Yeah, I think so. I think they're definitely in a in a very good position, all right. And I think I think the way the the league is is gone, I think it very much suits them. The fact they had down first and then West Mead and and then Mead, like they'll probably be fully strengthened up by the time that Mead comes comes around. And originally, I had a funny feeling that Mead would would beat Mayo, but having watched that performance yesterday, like I mean, it was just very it was very drab stuff altogether for Mead. Look, it is the first game, and I know obviously they're trying to get the likes of Mickey Newman up to speed and whatnot, and West Mead where very defensive had a lot of men behind the ball but 
I mean, yeah. the game was there for Westmead to win. Like it, it was just in discipline, and they 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 were you know architects of their own downfall. But I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the end, Westmead getting or in the end, Mead getting the win. Yeah, look, but um, I think that really, you know, we've been here before, like, but sometimes when you put in a rubbish performance and you still manage to win games, yeah. you know, I think that usually in a lot of team sports, that's actually a sign of progress in a way. I don't know how I can really word it that way, like, but sometimes if you play under par and you're still winning games, like, I think it just shows an ability to grind out ones, like, because I've seen my fair share of me playing football and the amount of times, like, um, I guess top teams that aren't Dublin, like your your Donny Goals, your Tyrone's, other ones. The amount of times, you know, with about five minutes to go, they're right in the game and they just they somehow just let it all go. Like, so I think it's now West Meath aren't a top team just yet, but definitely, you know, I'm not not going to say they don't have the potential of it, you know, and it's obviously the battle of Meath. You can say like who's the better Meath, but um, I think, um, yeah, look, it's a good one there. And it's obviously tough for me if you know that, you know, Mickey Newman's only coming back from injury. Graham Rayleigh's out, you know, and um, Jordan Morris, only a second year in the panel. A quality, quality footballer, like, but now he's in a position at about 20, 21, where he is the main man, which is probably a tough burden for a young player to hold, like, but still, it's um, a win nonetheless for me, and I'm sure they'll be happy to take the two points and they'll definitely have an improvement by next week yeah i suppose you do make a good point like obviously like with a lot of teams i suppose you do kind of need to get that habit of winning when you're not playing well and i suppose with me over the past year or so like even last year it did seem that you know when they didn't play well they you know things went really badly for them like that leinster final for example but i suppose you know it could be character building in some ways but just some of their shooting i thought in the first half even from the likes of Jordan Morris and a few of the other ones, was just a little bit lackluster. And look, it is the first game, so we'll cut them some slack. But I suppose getting that victory, I suppose, I suppose is the is the main thing. I suppose for for me, it's good rivals kill there. I mean, they're a team that definitely, um, I suppose, you know, made a, a statement win over Cork, two twelve to fourteen points, um, in uh, in the other group, of course, in Division Two, a massive win for the for the for the Lily Whites. Yeah, I think that Kildare result is a good example of, you know, what it means um, to to have faith in a manager, have faith in a long term project. You know, giving you know after one season, you know, where they, they always got relegated to Division Three, conceding five goals to me from the Leinster semi final. You know, the knives were really out. You know, in a lot of social media, people always think you know, you know, that um, getting Jack O'Connor, you know, so, so man outside of Kildare, even though he's um, quite an experienced coach elsewhere you know you know he, he knows what he's doing he's got a good care killer based uh background team with him you know and they're finally showing the project you know i think that's really a message to me maybe some other county boards that maybe would let my absolutely fantastic performance you know uh flynn absolutely phenomenal player you know you know i know he's been in and out of the Kildare panel you know but on his day he's one of the best footballers in leinster i'd say you know and he's definitely proved it there you know and um obviously cork you know there's a they built up a lot of hype after beating Kerry in the most championship you know but you have to remember they did get relegated two years ago you know they are the division three champion I'll be, you know, winning every probably touch on later, like, but still, um, I just feel it was um, a good result for um, Kildare, you know, and I'm sure Cork will definitely bounce back next, you know, I'm sure against, against um, Leash and Clare, they see maybe more winnable games, but still, you know, um, as we've seen yesterday, that Leash and Clare, no pushovers either. Yeah, with well, Kildare, like a, they're a team that has the potential. Like I was saying in previous podcasts and videos before, like they won the under twenty All Ireland in twenty eighteen with the likes of Jimmy mm. Hoyland and Derek Kirwan. Like, you know, I know the, the the gap in Leinster seems quite big to to Dublin, but if there was a team to look at, if there was a team to point at to bridge that gap, I'd look at Kildare because I think they definitely have the potential. It's just a matter mm. of putting those pieces together. It's a matter of their manager getting the best out of those team and Daniel Flynn last year was really poor I felt in the championship whether it was because he came back from Australia or whatever he just wasn't up to up to speed but getting the best out of him I think is uh, is essential for for this Kildare team Clare obviously with a 116 win to to leash to 12 points 
Uh, Owen Cleary, fantastic on the day with 10 points. Like his, uh, I don't know if you've seen his point from the sideline on the Sunday mm, game. Yeah, that's, but, um, that's his point, eh? Yeah. Yeah, top class stuff altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really was um, top class stuff from both, both sides, you know. And, um, they gave a good fight, you know. And I just feel that, you know, there's some players that clear their. An unknown quantity to to an extent at the same time, like but still, you know, under the post Gary Brennan area, they're I don't know, they become more of a team. And at least you know, yeah, there's a lot to prove, you know, from both teams. And I just think, yeah, they're not going on away anywhere anytime soon. Like, and um, maybe you know, it might I don't know, it might be the first time in, in since maybe 1992 that Clare have maybe assembled a better football team than Hurling team but I don't know I don't know it's only one game like I'm not I'm not putting the knife out just yet like but um I know there's other problems with the hurling board but still it's um a win not nonetheless like and I'm sure they're delighted uh to have it and yeah I suppose we'll, we'll get on to Clare Hurling in a moment anyway there's definitely a lot of uh disorganization I suppose going on there um, looking at Division Three, I mean, I suppose a big win for for Mana over Cavan. You were obviously saying when you came on my podcast not too long ago, you were saying, um, you know, that Cavan were going to have a bit of a hangover and potentially finish in a, a relegation playoff. Well, I suppose after that result, I mean, it looks probably likely because I don't think many people seen that coming. But a very spirited, brilliant performance by for Mana and the likes of Sean Quigley. Yeah, look, uh, Sean Quigley has made the difference. You know. Um, the big thing I think last year is that Racy McMenamin maybe inherited a team that lacked experience, you know. But now that they've got experience to some of the younger players, you know, like Darren McGurn, who you had in your podcast, and Sean Quigley, you know, for you know spearheading the attack, you know, there's I don't think there's a better that that's the kind of man you need, you know. And uh, um, obviously, I know I think you know also we all know about Sean Quigley, you know, and I think um, look, it's big for them, you know, and um. Before Roy Gallagher came, and you know, they had a reputation of being in a yo yo team, but no one, um, definitely, definitely an ambitious run around in there. And you know, it wasn't definitely wasn't an experimental cabin team either, like you can't deny that. Like, but um, I'm sure that they're like, and it is, it's the Lakeside Derby, you know, they're two neighboring counties, and I'm sure it'll be a good one. Then, you know, it was obviously a big clash, you know, both teams having 38 Ulster titles between them, you know, it's a, <laughs> a massive clash, you know, and Calvin <laughs> from <Poor> for Mana. <laughs> but still, um, you know, um, I, I don't think the guys are any better, you know, and Derry next week probably will be challenging, but definitely Longford um, could be a winnable, winnable game for them. Yeah, definitely, definitely a, a chance, and I suppose, Speaking of that game, like Derry, very, very serious team. Another side that I suppose we've spoke about as a potential yeah. real banana skin or, or you know, surprise package or whatever. Connor Glass in there, Rory Gallagher, top top class manager. I suppose they're, you know, looking very likely. They won 21 points to five against Longford. So I suppose they're looking like the, the team to beat in Division 3 at the moment. Yeah, look, I've heard, you know, during the lockdown, what Rory Gallagher was trying to implement with the team was to absolutely bulk up the team. You know, I've just seen in the past, you know, the Fermanagh men, and when he played with them, all big men, you know, a lot of the Donegal men, you know, took a other Jim McGuinness and Rory Gallagher would have been that way, like, you know. Um, so that that's the kind of team he's trying to build, like, and he's definitely a, going the right direction around it, you know, and he's, um, yeah, he's built a really, really strong team, you know, and... Um, you know, when 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 Derry is across across the border, you always like to slag them off, you know. But to be fair, um, Longford basically destroyed the entire and Derry any hope of getting promoted divisionally, albeit they might not have got it there. Like, but still, I just feel that you know that um, I was just very good, you know, to see Derry. you know nearly put manners on Longford now but, but still it's a fantastic fantastic one for Derry you know and um, they're definitely the dark horses in the Ulster Championship this year you know and then um, whether it's Donny Gore down he plays in the quarter final you know it's going to be so, yeah yeah um, yeah, I think he's on out there for, for, for a few minutes. But yeah, I suppose with Derry, definitely a, a you know a really big potential, I suppose, for them to to potentially go on and maybe make a, 
an Ulster semi final, and maybe shock a, a Donegal like haven't done last year. Um, I suppose in in division in the other group in Division Three, like we had that win for for Limerick over Tipperary, one thirteen to to fourteen points. Um, I suppose originally you would have seen this maybe as a shock, but I suppose when you look back at the game last year, like there was only it was very very close. There was only a point in it, so I suppose for Limerick yeah. getting that one thirteen to fourteen point win, it's probably not as big as a shock as as what people think. Yeah, look at that. I think I think it's a bit of an insult to Limerick football. You know, I predicted them to get promoted, and I think I'm still going to hold that narrative. Maybe them and Derry can't really see long for can't really see off the game promoted, even though they performed good against. What can we touch on that there? But Limerick, fantastic, fantastic team. You know, and I I talked about Tipperary also having a sort of a hangover. You know, and two years ago Limerick beat them. You know, and obviously similar to Calvin and Fermanagh, it's a local derby, probably. Kevin, you know, obviously Limerick and Tipperary, probably the biggest derby and hurling. You know, I don't think, you know, but obviously in football, I'm sure the football people of Limerick and Tipperary are, you know, <laughs> going tongues and hammer each other. But still, um, I'm sure it's a very good result for um, Limerick, you know, and it's definitely that there. Like, you know, I, I feel if they can beat um, Tipperary, what's going to stop them from beating Offaly? What's going to stop them from beating Wicklow? Yeah, they're in a perfect position now, I think, to get promoted and like even with Paul Maher a full back or at a cornerback like he's a very very tidy player and mm. um, was very impressed with him and I suppose yeah they've, they've a real potential now Limerick and they've been one of those sides that even last year have kind of just been slowly going under the radar just kind of going up from Division 4 and I mean if they could get to Division 2 I mean that would be some achievement mm. altogether Um but I suppose, obviously, in the other game, you had Offaly 114, Wicklow 110. I suppose not the best performance in the world from Offaly. It looked like they were going to run away with it early on, and then Wicklow kind of came back late on in the game. But in the end, I suppose a win is a win for uh, for Offaly. Absolutely. You know, um, as I touched on the Meath game there, you know, I think that shows a per ability of a strong team. You know, sometimes even if you have a rubbish performance and you get on, like we've been there as Donegal and Dublin fans, you know, but sometimes I, I don't want to, like, I, I don't think a good, bad performances are bad, but are good, like, but still, you know, it's it's the difference between a good team and a bad team. You know, if on an off day, you can still win a game, you're a top, top team. Uh, but, you know, I think that's what really, you know, like, because any team, if they have a good day, can win a game in the GA, but I just feel that's the French, you know, and that probably shows it there. Like, and obviously, we, you know, um, very ambitious team with John Mohan, you know, and um, they've obviously, you know, fr- thrown Dave Dempsey up at the half forward. I was a wee bit surprised to see, like, but look, you know, John Mohan, he's a bit of a genius when it comes to smaller counties. I don't think, you know, he's a smart, smart man when it comes to Gaelic football, and um, yeah, top, top, top one for them, you know, and they've. Kane Johnson, they've a few others coming through, like, and they just um, you feel like they've quality to become at least an established Division Two team. But you know, if Derry for Mana and Limerick and performances, it's going to be really edges your seat stuff watching who's going to get promoted to Division Two, like, and um, yeah, it's good, it's good to be entertained, you know. And um, I look forward to you know seeing how they get on. Yeah, I suppose you could you could split a knife through butter with a lot of those teams in Division Three. I mean, there's really nothing a lot, you know, nothing really between a lot of them. It's very very competitive. It's going to be interesting to see how it goes. Division Four will run through some results here, like Loud three uh, eight, Antrim one fifteen, big win for and the McGinley, and obviously Sligo two nineteen, Leitrim eighteen. So I suppose big wins for for both Sligo and Antrim. Absolutely, you know, um, Sligo, obviously, you know, under Tony McIntyre taking full force, you know, and um, obviously they've been, I predicted them to get the promotion up to the, and yeah, they're, they're definitely showing their true colours, like, um, obviously, you know, getting out of Division 4 is probably, just probably what Mickey Hart was brought in for life, like, but I, I feel, you know, with his record with Tyrone, I feel he's more, the kind of man you know they want to bring in for a good qualifier run and maybe a sneak to the Super 8 to quarterfinals, whatever the future of Gaelic football is beyond the pandemic, you know. But I definitely feel you know that that's it. Um, and I think, um, yeah, really, really top, top performance. Um, from Antrim, you know, and getting that that one, one point one, you know, it's definitely ambitious for them, you know. Obviously, you know, a lot of people talk about the population of Antrim, you know, and them being division four, like, but still, um, it's good. It's a good one for all of them, you know, and I'm sure uh, against uh, Snyder or Leitrim, it will be, it will be tougher for Andrew Lick, but still, you know, if 
Mickey Hart, you know, gets more experience with the team, you know, and he's obviously never had that yet, you know, but they can get results like, but still, um, I'm, I'm not going to really be too judgmental of any of the new management teams that were put in place yet, you know, and um, I still think Terry Highland's a top coach for Le- Leitrim. Yeah, he is definitely, like, he's done a, he's done a great job with Leitrim. I was surprised to see them get beat by Sligo. I thought they would have won that game, in, in all honesty. Um, and it, yeah, tough, tough defeat for Leitrim. It's hard to see how they'll get promoted from here on in. And I suppose for Mickey Hart's loud, a, a disappointing defeat as well. Definitely some positives like Sam Mulroy hit 2 2 in that game. And I suppose for Antrim, Dermot McAleese, I thought he was very quite bright at a, a wing back. But um, Carlo, I suppose they're probably maybe looking like one of the, the top teams in, in Division Four. I know they're only playing Waterford. Um, with all due respect to Waterford, like it was yeah. 3 16 to 10. But you know, Carlo, I suppose, looking in a good position at the moment. Yeah, that that, that group yeah. always means everything. You know, I think their their game that that basically means Waterford probably won't be going up up now, like unless they can pull off a massive shock against Wexford. You know, and if it's to say um, Carlo Wexford, you know, will be be that way. You know, it's obviously tough. You know, with three teams, obviously London had the opt out. You know, and personally, I feel you know maybe throwing like a double or twice, maybe even like a DCU or some kind of a university team or something. To fill in it, you know, maybe yeah, just to get another game. Of, yeah, yeah, just to get another game. Like, and but look, look, um, I'm sure they're best, you know, and I predict a Sligo and Carlo to get it. Like, and I, I'm still pretty confident that's going to be a Sligo and Carlo are going to get promoted. And you know, they finally got the new management, um, a place they finally got the experience, you know, and um, they might be that bit more rested for the semi finals, but still, you know, good, good one for Carlo and um. They they're a division three standard team, you know, similar to Sligo, and they shouldn't they shouldn't be in division four like but um say most teams in division four feel like they shouldn't be there, but look, that's it. Yeah, yeah, definitely interesting. All right. I suppose we'll we'll run through my football team of the week. Um for those watching at home, we'll see a, a graphic on screen at the moment. Um so I suppose in goal we'd Sean Patton of Donegal. I thought he'd done quite bright, he made it one or two smart saves and in, in that game versus Tyrone. Then in the full back line it was Ushin Mullen. Aidan Forker and Paul Marr, so Ocean Mullen and Mayo, Aidan Forker of Armagh, Paul Marr of Limerick. And then in the uh, the halfback line, it was Kevin Flynn of Kildare, David Hyland of Kildare, and Paul Murphy of Kerry. Then in midfield, it was David Moran of Kerry, partnered up with Connor Glass of Derry. That was a, a late change. Um, and then in the, the half forward line, Paul Donaghy of Tyrone, Owen Cleary of Clare, Paddy Clifford of Kerry. And then the full forward line, Cormac Costello of Dublin, Sean Quigley of Fermanagh. And David Clifford, of course, of uh, of Kerry. I suppose there can't be too many arguments with David Clifford being the the player of the week. I suppose in many ways. But what would you make yeah. of that team yourself? Anyway, would you make any changes? Yeah, look, um, I would find a way of putting Michael Murphy in, but it's who yeah. he replaces is the big question. You know, we could have probably edged a one or a draw without Murphy. Could have Tyrone been hammered if we pulled on him? Yeah, pr- probably. That's the question. You know. Owen Cleary scores against Clare, like there's no nine, you know, and there is four divisions, you know, and Sean Quigley's impact with Fermanagh, you know, and one of the results of the weekend, you know, it's definitely um grand noise here, but at least you didn't do the G8A official one, like, and they didn't put, they threw in Michael Murphy, but put him in midfield, like he's not a midfielder, yeah. like he shouldn't, <laughs> he shouldn't be doing it just for the sake of it. He had a good performance, like, but, you know, just don't <laughs> put him in the forward line, but obviously I'm happy to see Sean Patton there, you know, obviously, you know, he's, more experience, you know, he's maturing into probably one of the best, if not the best goalkeeper in the country now. Like, and I definitely think it's a top performance from him. Like, and um, yeah, um, an ambitious one, like you know, and obviously Connor Glass sneaking his way into the team. You know, I feel, feel smart is a good decision, you know, because I was kind of waiting a few years for him to come of age, but then he went to AFL and then you know, obviously came back and he's a different player. And he just, I don't know what to say, you know, he's one of the main men for Derry, and um, I could. I wouldn't even rule out him getting an all star if Derry make a good run in the Ultra Championship this year. Like so I, I don't really have that much arguments about it, you know. And um yeah, it's obviously a very, very impressive um performance here and um I feel yeah. Yeah, I suppose if they could find a way past Donegal, definitely a definitely a chance of a of an all star for, for Connor Glass, definitely. And like what you what you said with Michael Murphy, I definitely think he uh, had a great game. I think he kicked six points. He looked more kind of like the Michael Murphy maybe of two or three years ago, and um, where he was kind of more operating more in the forward line rather than drifting into midfield or defence. Like he was he was impressive stuff altogether. I suppose like there are I do have some honourable mentions here as well. Like Kieran Corrigan, I thought was 
quite positive for 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 Mana. He hit four points on the day before his uh, black card, which didn't really make sense. But Sam Roy, yeah, two two on the day. Niall Murphy of Sligo was good. Keith Byrne of um of, of Leitrim. You Jamie Clark, the Carlo version, not the not the Armagh one. <laughs> uh, Aaron Mulligan of 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 uh, of Monaghan was quite bright as well. And you've loads of players like Jimmy Highland, Brian Fenton. You could put Tom Lahiff in there from Dublin, Killian Spillane, Patrick Lynch, Oshin O'Neill. I suppose there's just so many games across the the entire country. I mean, you just you can't really fit everyone in, like.